the charge and he could punish Watson. He does. Steve Ball in only the second minute. Wonderful start for Wolves. The testimonial season has been a great success, thanks to you, the supporters. Your loyalty to me has kept me at Molyneux for the past 10 years, and I'm sincerely grateful. With your encouragement, I've continued to break golf sporting records throughout my career with Wolves. And in this special year, it gave me great satisfaction to take my tally past the 300 mark. It was an achievement that earned me this Golden Boot Award, which was presented to me on an emotional night at the Civic Centre. It was a special night for me, attended by so many people whom I got the utmost respect for, and I hope this programme catches the spirit of what really was a unique occasion. I didn't know what to expect when the event was organised, but every one of the 2,000 tickets were sold, and I couldn't have asked for a better reception than the one I was given. It all made me realise what great supporters we have at Wolverhampton Wonders Football Club, thanks to everyone who have supported me over the last 10 years. Shut up now, I want to sit down. Go and have a seat, Steve, take the weight off your legs. Have a seat in the corner, we've got a few friends, we've got lots of surprises. <laughs> we are going to have a great night! <laughs> Get your leg, <laughs> I'm losing it. It's a sensitive point with him at the moment. If he bends down, you'll see the spotlight will catch the top of his head. Look. Is that? Is that? Nah. <laughs> I, uh, I hope nobody's in a rush. Well, we're going to go through the whole of the the 10 years in as much detail as the guests and the pictures and dare I say time will allow. We are going to have a good night. We've had a, 
A lot of fun along the way with the testimonial. As many of you will probably know, we've been out and about in clubs um, throughout. You can't even really call it the immediate catchment area. We've been for miles. And I tell you, if you scale this down to the 300 or so people that we have at most of those nights, the reception has been no less warm and Steve has been no less appreciated. I want to take you, first of all, back to what we would perhaps call the early years. Sadly, we haven't been able to raid the family album for any really embarrassing pictures of you, Steve, when you were oh, a young man. Thanks. There's the odd one coming along, but we couldn't get, we wanted the, you know, the one on the rug with your bottom sticking in the air. <laughs> Is the one? No. Let's let's. Uh, is there a picture like that? I tell you what, if there is, we've missed out, haven't we? What wouldn't we have paid for that picture? Anyway, we haven't got it, so never mind. Let us move on. I want to introduce you to two people first of all, who uh, go back to the the early days. He was at uh, Tipton Town, you may remember. John Cross was, indeed, still is the secretary there. And Sid Day was the man who spotted Steve playing for Tipton Town and in 1985 recommended him to the word I can't use because it's rude, but they play a little bit down the road. Would you welcome on stage, please, the first of our guests tonight from those early years at Tipton, John Cross and Sid Day. So tell me, when did they first know, John, that um, Tipton Town might have something a little bit special? I would say, Bob, um, he made his mark in the first team in 1984, but it scored before then millions of goals for the youths and for the reserves, a lower standard. He came in the first team, um, he took it by storm, he scored 14 in 17 games, and then Sid took a chance and took him up the Albion. The rest <laughs> Wash your mouth out, sir. <laughs> Hey, we, we can't have a riot this early in the evening, you know. He took him up the road, yes. Took him up the road. Um, <laughs> Mr. Saunders couldn't see anything in, in him at all. Uh, the, uh, the Wolves manager of the day could, the England manager of the day could, the Albion couldn't. <laughs> That's a fair point. John, well, as I said, Sid Day was the man who, who actually thought he ought to be going and playing professionally. Sid, how old was Steve and what do you remember about those early days of watching him? I first saw him when I was 13 year old playing in a house match over the schools. He was grafting away, brave, tenacious, wouldn't intimidate easily. He'd got a goal instinct. And he was trying to put shots of goals from outside the area, although he was only a little bit. You know, he got good timing. So I asked him to come and play for Tipton, your team, in two years' time. What, uh, what were those elbows doing when he was 13? Digging him in the ribs. <laughs> And uh, obviously, I, pr I presume Steve liked the idea of going to you know where. Um, and uh, who was it at West Brom? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Who was it at the Hawthorns who thought that he was? Uh, he was. I, c I can say that, can't I? Yeah. It's the ground where wolves always win, isn't it? Yeah. And and they don't. Um, who was it at uh, at that club who actually said? Thanks for bringing him. I think you've, we've got a good in here. Well, it was a combination of myself, Roy Orbin and Nobby Styles, you know. I think, Steve, in fact, you've said before that uh, Nobby Styles was, was a key man then. He's the one that uh, started me all credit off. He's the one that brought me up from when I was younger. And when I was raw, he, he educated me uh, to here now. I think people tend to think that when you go and play for a professional club, it's, it, it's glamour from the start, but you, you were working hard in those days. Just tell us the sort of uh, workload you had as well as playing soccer. Did I? Well, <laughs> he, <laughs> he yeah. says he did. <laughs> I, did. I used to work in a builder's yard to start with, 13 hours a day, uh, and then Sid used to pick me up on Tuesday and Thursday night and train with the kids at the, the club up the road, and, uh, and that's how it uh, followed on. I used to take him with Dad Burris. I was taking with Dan Burris. <laughs> and, and you thought, when you were playing there, you thought this is going to be better than uh, working as you were doing during the day? Well, I did, actually. They, they did, uh, I think they offered me about £20 more than what the, the, the firm I was working with. I thought, well, yeah, take the gamble and gamble paid off. So there's much to say thank you to John and Sid for. Well, Sid and John are the, the ones who started me off. Ladies and gentlemen, John Cross and Sid Day. <laughs> Thank you.
There was um, not only Steve Bull, who came to Molyneux that day. I must find out shortly what the price was, because every time you hear the story, the price differs. But suffice to say, it wasn't an awful lot of money. And we can have a look now at um, the little fella who came with him, scoring a goal. And here's Steve Bull, just a little too wide for him. And he'll get the cross in all right. Shot from Dawson! Oh! Thompson, he was calling for the ball earlier. It didn't matter. He got there in the end. Bulls cross. It's 2-0 to Wolverhampton Wanderers. And uh, there was the headline from the Express and Star. Graham Turner spent around £70,000 for two players. And do you remember what they looked like? I think all are quite sensible there himself. <laughs> Isn't that a nice picture? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you need no further introduction except to say that on the day that Steve came to Molyneux, with him came Andy Thompson. We do, of course, need to clear one thing up, that when these two signed, it was BC, before Chorley. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know, I know that they sat and watched that game. Some of it. Some, Some of it. Of it. <laughs> I bet the drinks went down well that night. The second half, did it, yeah, so what have we done? <laughs> yeah, it was a memorable night, eh? First game, we was there. And so, it was at Bolton, of all places, as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so when we've gone there, so they got Chorley in the cup, so they got a draw down at the Molyneux, and they ended up playing there. And so, I think, was it three and a half time? Something like that. Three and a half time, and so and, well, the head was shaking, we went, what have we done? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, fortunately, things improved pretty quickly, didn't they? Not for the next two games, they didn't. <laughs> I didn't mean that quickly. <laughs> I think it was 3-0, three 3-0, nil, three nil, the next two as well. Oh, yeah. yeah, so after that, so we had a very good run. So we missed out to um, go an automatic up against South End away. And then, but, say, after, the, after that, the year after that, we went straight up and so we did the same in the third division as well. There was almost a time when you were, were going to leave the club. You were going to go to Huddersfield. What on earth did Steve say to you? <laughs> 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 you can, you can, um, you can knock out the odd word if you need to here. He's making me tea in the morning, that's it. <laughs> no, he was just, he just, <laughs> yeah, he just said, look, at the end of the day, I said I wasn't playing at the time, so it was just an opportunity to come for me to leave the club, so I'm glad that I didn't say, so, look, because I've had a, another four years here and it's been great. It's uh, also, of course, worth pointing out that uh, Andy and Robbie are enjoying testimonials this year. Andy, the, the friendship with Steve is, is, a, is a lot uh, deeper than just playing soccer together, isn't it? No. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, we've been friends from the day one, so since coming that four Cortina when he brought to the Molyneux. So, I was just about to get on the bus when he first came in. <laughs> so, but I helped him push it to get here, so, but... Uh, <laughs> nothing, it's just took off from there. Well, as you say, ten years on, it's worked a treat. Ladies and gentlemen, Andy Thompson. <laughs> April 1988, and Wolves get promotion by winning 3-1 at Newport. Steve scored 52 goals in the 87-88 season, and Wolves, of course, were champions. Nearly 2,000 Wolves fans travelled to Newport on a Tuesday night to see Bull lead the way with another glorious double. His first goal might have been a tap-in, but the goal that completed a remarkable half-century was as sweet as they come. Two more Bull goals in the final match at home to Hartlepool. Wolves were fourth division champions, the first club to win all four divisions of the Football League. 
in that team and key men in that particular promotion run. One of them's still there, as I said, he too is enjoying his testimonial at Wolves this season, along with Steve and Andy. I'll bring them on separately because I really think we ought to have a little applause for them individually. Would you first welcome, please, Robbie Dennison. <laughs> This is Robbie Dennison. Roberts looking at the far post. Dennison. Oh, what a goal! And also from that same team, Keith Downing. I'll start with you, Robbie. You um, followed Steve and uh, Andy up the road. Uh, did they convince you it was a good move, or did you think you wanted to get away from that manager? Um, well, actually, I didn't actually speak to him in the time since they left until I actually joined Wolves, so it was... <laughs> I'm shouting. No, it was, it was just a matter of trying to get first-team football, and that's the reason why I moved. As I say, I didn't speak to Tom or Bill before the move went. Did you think that uh, perhaps Wolves were uh, aiming for better days and heading for them then? Well, things had started to take off just before I joined, but to be quite truthful, I didn't, I didn't really know much about the, the Wolves scene or whatever. Like, so it was, it was just an opportunity for me to get the first team football again. Well, Keith Downing, uh, there seemed from what we've seen so far and what we're going to see later, there's great team spirit among them. It was great team spirit. I mean, um, the set of lads were all down-to-earth guys and um, mucked in together and worked very, very hard for each other. And... Uh, well, the club was obviously down on its feet at the time and uh, it was just a good, good bunch of lads to work with. Uh, I'm surprised actually, Bob, you haven't pulled any goals out for me. Um, it was a bit of a rarity, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> we, um, unfortunately, they're all in black and white. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Robbie Edison and Keith Downing. Well, we've already made mention of the uh, Sherpa Van Trophy. Burnley 2-0, May 1988. Do you realize on that occasion that Wembley Stadium had an official attendance of 80,841, which was 10,000 more than went to watch England and Scotland the week before? It says much, I suspect, for the pulling power of Wolves that so many people went, and I'm sure most of you were there as well. So let's um, get back to the tape and let's enjoy some celebratory moments from a few years ago at Molyneux. A massive crowd of nearly 81,000 turned up for the Wembley final against Burnley. Bull had scored in all previous seven ties in the competition, but for once he wasn't on the score sheet, though he did tee up the first goal for his striking partner, Andy Mudge. <laughs> Wolves went on to win 2 0, Robbie Dennison clinching victory with a spectacular free kick. Another piece of silverware on its way to Molyneux, Bully had a cup winner's medal to crown an incredible year. A few faces to recognise and moments to reminisce there, and another of what turned out to be a very shrewd buy for little or no money. Would you welcome, please, Alistair Robertson. Oh, Ali. Oh, Still walking, I see. <laughs> Now, I bet you don't remember a thing about that day, do you? <laughs> Can't remember anything at all. For me, I was too old. I was knackered. It was these young lads who did it all. So I was just quite happy he got there and picked that trophy up. Yeah, it was lovely. I suppose that one of the more extraordinary points about that game was the fact that Steve didn't actually score in it. I think it was about the only game through the season he hadn't done. I feel sorry for him because at that time, we were willing for him to score because through his goals and Andy's, through those two, we got there. And we were desperate for Steve to score that day because it must have been great for him to score at Wembley. What, um, what were the celebrations like afterwards? I mean, you can tell us now, we're some years on. It must, 
Must have been quite lively. No, they were good lads that didn't drink. Didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? The boss is down there, isn't he? Like, so we better see if he didn't drink. <laughs> no, they were good lads. It's like we said earlier. The camaraderie between all the lads was absolutely brilliant. Like, I was granddad. I was like 25 years old and everybody else. And the younger lads, to be fair to them, they enjoyed themselves, but they knew when and when to. Every Thursday, they knew they couldn't drink, they didn't go out, so we tell the gaffer. And uh, when it comes to Saturday, they knew what they had to do, and they enjoyed themselves Saturday night, which is the right way to do it. Steve, those scenes and celebrations, I mean, at Wembley were, were something else, weren't they? And then, of course, when you came back to Wolverhampton as well. Yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. All around the town, we had an open top buzz. I think it's from the Mount Hotel, all the way through the town. It was, it was unbelievable, you can't, you can't like, say to the people what it feels like inside here, seeing so many people. Uh, but seeing you achieve and do things like that. It was a great day and a great occasion, and we're very grateful to Alistair Robertson. <laughs> In reasonably recent times, there used to be a pair who scored the odd goal or two for Wolves. They were called Dugan and Richards. And, uh, I think the next really great partnership, well, here's, we keep seeing him. Let's have a look at the other guy. Bennett fires one forward for Ball. Ball, much, yes, 1-0. Well, what kind of a start? Wolves with their very first attack, the ball punched forward by Tom Bennett. Find Steve Ball, who flicks it over the head of Mark Grew. Need I say more? Ladies and gentlemen, if you welcome, please, Andy March. I think they're pleased to see you. Oh, yeah. I'm pleased to see them as well, to be honest. <laughs> It was a great partnership, and it, it, I mean, you both scored lots of goals. I mean, Steve got the bulk of them. Did you um, sort of do all the hard work, did you? No, I was just jealous because he scored all the goals and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously, we had a good partnership. Uh, we worked very hard together. I mean, at first, we had no idea how it was going to go. Um, um, as I said, we both worked very hard, and obviously, we got the rewards. Obviously, Steve had the lion's share of the goals. Uh, I was glad to come in with a few and uh, obviously lay a few on for him. How does this guy um, feature in your, your thinking of striking partners, Steve? Well, he's a different class. Uh, I think if, uh, if Mutida had been here uh, when we had the Bolton playoffs that, that day, I think the combination of where I've known him over the last seven years, I think that would have uh, played better for him. Would have got <laughs> you, uh, I'll just tell you one thing about this guy. We know about the, the great partnership they had on the field and, and the great friendship as well. Andy Much played a game on Saturday. They were down, at, drove down to Gillingham. He got home at five o'clock this morning, a few hours in bed, in the car, down here. He wasn't going to miss tonight for anything. Ladies and gentlemen, Andy Much! Nineteen eighty eight, eighty nine, and Wolves are third division champions, and Steve Ball scores fifty goals. Graham Turner said that Wolves were the best group of players he'd worked with in twenty years in management. And this is uh, a little bit of pictorial history from uh, Graham's time with Steve at Wolves. Uh, we got to Sheffield United. Uh, we needed a point. They needed a point for promotion. And also, I needed a goal, for, goal myself for the, the 50 goals. Uh, if, if to, thankfully, we got all three. As I say, they got a point, we draw two each. Uh, Mucha went down the left hand, left hand wing, crossed the ball, easy topping header, 50 goals, promotion. Everything that a, a man wanted them. In just two and a half years, Steve Bull's goals had dragged Wolves out of Division 4 into the second, a time for celebration. Tremendous! Oh, I'm going to join now! Oh, great! <laughs> I've got to say, 
I've been talking to this guy for many years, and that little clip there with the cap on is one of my favourites. It <laughs> says everything about him and about the club. And who was the man who we said right at the start, who took the gamble, if, if it was a gamble? What a gamble. Graham Turner. I hear you cry, they remember me. Graham, when you look back at those days, just let's, let's settle one thing first of all. We, we talked about the signing of, of Steve and Andy. Uh, they obviously came highly recommended to you. How much did you really pay for Steve Ball? It finished up 64,000. Uh, it was a down payment, I think of 40. And to be fair to Ron Saunders, he didn't want to part with him and it took a lot of persuading and I was almost giving it up. We'd arranged for, for Andy Thompson to come across and I thought I'd just have one last go at him. And he bent a little bit. I think Sid Lucas, who was there the, then the chairman, had told him he had to cut his staff, but he didn't mean the young lads. And I think Sid Lucas, to be fair to him, he was broken hearted when Steve left. So I don't think it was as easy as people think and I don't think he was as discarded as people think. Uh, <laughs> terrific. Every, everything he did while, he was, while I was at the club has been absolutely outstanding. I mean, OK, you wanted somebody to score goals and he came highly recommended, but you could never have foreseen what he would go on to achieve. Oh, no, it was absolutely incredible, wasn't it? His, his goal-scoring record. And you've got to say, of all the people I've ever worked with in football, uh, Steve, at his job, was, was the best I've ever worked with. Absolutely incredible. <laughs> And to score more than 50 goals twice, I mean, it's just about unheard of, isn't it? I think that was incredible, but it also speaks volumes for the rest of the lads as well. There was a, a terrific spirit amongst them. They were very close. I hadn't realised just how close they were until I heard Tomo and, and Bully talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew exactly where they used to drink. We used to get a phone call from the wine bar on a Wednesday lunchtime. Ali's in again with the lads. <laughs> <laughs> but we had a terrific spirit, and Ali typified it, and Steve Bull led from the front with, with Andy, and uh, great days, most enjoyable days I've had in football. A tremendous seven and a half years, even if the last few years went slightly wrong, the, the, the first few years, absolutely magnificent. And when... Um... <laughs> And when you come back here tonight and see this, what goes through your mind? Well, I think when you go away from the place, you just forget a little bit about the passion. Not a lot in Hereford, is there? <laughs> well, I thought it, it was just like going to Hereford on a night out when the ciders arrived, you know? <laughs> but uh, you do forget, a, a, you know, it just drifts into distant memories at times. And uh, it's nice to come back and be reminded about the passion that uh, is still involved in the club. It's one of the world's biggest clubs, and uh, it'd be nice to see it get back to that top level again and be competing with the very best in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the man who brought Steve Ball to Wolves, Graham Turner. <laughs> Graham Turner, a very popular guest on our programme tonight. Are you enjoying it, Steve? Yeah, not too bad so far. <laughs> if, it, uh, if it hadn't been Thursday night, we could have got you a drink, couldn't we? But well, it's one of the things, you know, in game on Saturday, prepare yeah. right. Do you want a glass of water? Can we get you some no, water? Or something? No, you're okay. I'm not saying much, I'm not saying I'm okay. Right. Let everybody else have the talk if it wants. May the 27th, 1989. I wonder if you can remember what happened. Steve Ball scored his first goal for England against Scotland at Hampden Park. And he was still a third division player. Here it is, here's the moment. 10 minutes remaining. Ball, and again. Right 
in the corner. What a start. Scoring on his debut. The man from the third division and Wolves, although they're about to leave there. The one memory that sticks out as far as Bully's concerned is when we played Scotland at Hamden and uh, John Fashion who got to, he was injured early on in the game and, and Bully came on and he absolutely destroyed the, the Scots and um, I've always been pleased to do that. I would love to go to Hamden and, and get good results against him. And Bully was excellent that day. I mean he, he actually tore them apart um, and we won the game 2-0. And he, he was excellent on that night. But he's, he's a good pro and he, he works hard at the game. And, that, and he des deserves everything he's got out of the game. Steve, let me ask you, um, we're indebted to Brian Robson for that little clip. Obviously, he's uh, got one or two things on his mind at the moment. And one or two things not on his mind at the moment. Steve, when you're in that dressing room and you put that England shirt on, tell me what it felt like. Well, it's, I can't really say because it's when I was when I was there, I was on the I was on the Swords bench anyway, on the, against Scotland, and uh, when uh, John Fashioner came off last ten minutes, he, he just says, uh, "Go on, babe, do your stuff." I thought, "Oh, yeah. it'd be funny, like." But, uh, that was, those were his exact words as he came off the pitch. I went, oh, "All right then." I, <laughs> Friend of yours and Andy's, is he? <laughs> But it was a, a very good experience. And you actually saw the Wolves fans who had gone to that game, didn't you, in yeah, the I crowd? Yeah, I could see about 50 Wolves, Wolves shirts at the top corner and uh, applauded them all the way, yeah, brilliant. By the way, I was very thin then, wasn't I? <laughs> I thin I was. And just bear in mind that at that particular moment, Steve was, of course, still playing his league football in the third division, so the achievement is probably even greater. Well done. <laughs> Some of you may well remember where you were on New Year's Day, 1990. They went on aeroplanes, they went on coaches, they drove. They missed the city, I think. And they went... I find to tell him that. They went to Newcastle, and who, as you've already said, was in the Newcastle team, but Mark McGee. Here he is. Of course, he was later to come to Molyneux, and here's a little... Selection of all weathers and all faces sitting in the dugout, agonizing, biting his nails, and preparing to shout at the referee. Now, uh, this was a, a very special day. January the 1st, 1990. Newcastle 1, Wolves 4. Now, it was a great club day, wasn't it? It was a, it was a day for everybody, really. I think uh, the fans loved it, uh, the, the players and the managers loved it, and I think the, the whole atmosphere at St James' Park uh, loved it. Uh, for myself especially, it was a, a brilliant day. I'm going to Newcastle today, I've finished my very busy schedule now. I'm off up to see the Wolves, uh, playing Newcastle, and we're hoping for a very good win today. I've never flown and I have fright to death. <laughs> my girlfriend bought me this ticket, I didn't know nothing about it. A total of six planes carried the army of Wolves fans to Newcastle. Every fan had paid around £75 for the New Year's Day flight. It turned out to be money well spent. While the fans arrived in style, the players were making their way to St James Park by the more traditional team bus. For the fans, it was a great day out, and they arrived in the northeast in high spirits, hoping to see Steve Bull and Co conquer the Magpies. I think it was a lucky day for me. <laughs> All four went in. I think it was about four shots I had. Uh, second half, I can't believe it comes second half because usually they come early on, early on the game. But uh, the four goals itself. Uh, was, Two of them were tappings and the other two was uh, uh, quite uh, good goals for myself. Here's Christensen, oh, a dreadful mistake. Cook, and Bull in the centre, who scores? A goal for Wolves from Bull. This is promising again, on goes Steve Bull. Is he in here for his second? He is. Denison with the corner. Oh, the keeper made a mess of that, and Bull is there for his hat-trick. Away goes Denison now, striding away too. They've got three up here, including Steve Bull. And he's in again. Four for Bull. I was more happy for 
the fans really because of the hours of travel down on the plane and everything. It was unbelievable. I say it's, it's a big ground and I was just, it was just great to play it. Out of those four, Kent, can you actually pick one of them out? Well, I could pick all four out, but uh, the, the one that uh, the, the I'll stick was the third on the attic that went in. You always remember the third one that got in because it's a, a special, a special thing, and that was one of the, the times the aeroplane came out. And, and I'm right in thinking that a certain Mark McGee was playing. Yeah, well, he wouldn't have. Uh, I would have scored all four if he hadn't been playing because uh, he missed a sitter early on doors. Uh, I shouldn't say it because he's a present raise at the time. Uh, might get some stick for it, but. Uh, he missed a, a sitter early on indoors, and then we come out near the second half, and it all happened. You don't remember having any conversation with him that day at all? No, I think it was you, you lucky something like that set when, when he came off the pitch, but that was about it. Chap, yes. That was it, yeah, <laughs> lucky chap. <laughs> In the summer of 1990, Steve went with the England squad for the last time to Italy in the World Cup. It was also the time when a certain goalkeeper announced his retirement. Let's just have a look at a special moment that involves both Steve and the said goalkeeper. Dixon. Lineker. Walker. Taken by Bilek. Kubik a little slow. And here's Ball. Oh, well struck. It's 1-1. And really that came as a result of Kubik being caught in midfield. And the crowd roaring in appreciation. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome on please on stage, please, Mr. Peter Shilton. That was a splendid piece of cooperation between the two of you, wasn't it? <laughs> I hope that's not the action shot you've got me tonight, actually, throwing the ball out. But, uh, no, obviously, uh, you know, I had some great times with Steve with England and um, probably should have had a few more good times, really, I suppose, over the years. I was going to say, I mean, an awful lot of people feel that certain strikers have had many chances. Um, Steve didn't really get as many as he should, did he? No, I don't think so. Um, Steve's what I call uh, an old-fashioned centre forward. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's very enthusiastic, he uses his strengths, and uh, he does what he's, he's there to do, and that's score goals. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think he... Uh, a lot of it's down to the managers that, uh, that are in uh, the England team, looking after the England team at the time, but I think Steve obviously deserved a lot more chances on the goals he scored. And um, do you remember uh, keeping goal for Bolton once? Um, I think it was a, I think it was a playoff match, and um, Steve scored, didn't he? He did, yeah, I remember that. Very, just before half time, I think it was. Um, to be honest, I was, I was very surprised to be playing that game. I, I went to Bolton as. Uh, to give them a little bit of cover towards the end of the season. And uh, I came on a substitute for them at Stoke after about 10 minutes and uh, played reasonably well. And I went into the ground um, a couple of days later and the lad said that we think you're playing in, at Wolves in the playoffs. And uh, I thought they were taking the mick to start with. But uh, I mean, I, I remember the, the day very clearly and it was, a, it was a tremendous atmosphere. That's the one thing I remember. And it was a, a really good game of football. I remember making a, a, a pretty good save from Steve uh, just in the middle of the first half, and then just in half time, of course, he, he got his head to one and, uh, and stuck it past me. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest goalkeepers England has ever had, Mr. Peter Shilton. <laughs> May 1990 proved to be a hugely important date on the calendar in the history of Wolverhampton Wanderers when the man who'd been called Union Jack because of all the support he'd given to the country where he was born decided that it was high time he got involved 
in the town where he was born and brought up, living just a stone's throw from the ground and admitting that as a lad he used to creep under the turnstiles and didn't pay. That man, of course, was Sir Jack Hayward, and what has happened since The, uh, one of the early acts of uh, Sir Jack was to bring Billy Wright back to the club and put him on the board and those of us who knew Bill well knew what that meant to him to come onto the board. And two years later, uh, his son Jonathan became one of the youngest football chairmen in the country. And we can now see if he's aged in a few years because we've got uh, Jonathan with the team, little pre-season. There they are lining up. Let's have a good look at that. And my word, he has got a few more grey hairs, hasn't he? <laughs> Heavens, though, he looks serious even then. Would you welcome, please, the chairman of Wolverhampton Wanderers, Mr. Jonathan Hayward. It's, uh, it's no secret, I know, that um, before your father decided to uh, spend some of the family money in the football club of the town of his birth, you actually, actually weren't a Wolves fan, were you? Why did you have to bring that up, Bob, on a night? <laughs> well, I, you know, <laughs> a lovely evening like this. You bring something like that up. You didn't tell me upstairs you were going to say that. <laughs> well, you see, you'd have prepared your answer then, wouldn't you? It's the, go on, they won't mind because they know you're, that you're gold and black through and through. Who was your, your team as a lad? Um, well, they were sort of in the Manchester area, perhaps. <laughs> Old Trafford, perhaps. Well, it could have been somewhere close to there, yes. <laughs> On a serious note, Jonathan, when, once your father decided to get involved with the club, and uh, were you a willing uh, chairman and willing director in the very early days? I was, yes. It was incredibly exciting. I, I was delighted to get, get involved, and it was a great privilege to, to be involved with such a historic football club and uh, we've had some ups and downs since then but I've <clears throat> never really regretted it. When you looked at the assets of the club in those early days I would imagine that SG Ball was at the top of that list wasn't it? He was. Um, Steve and, and Graham Turner at that time were, were probably two of the main reasons why Sir Jack got involved so um, the club in its history have got a lot to thank Steve Ball. There are two and a half thousand people here tonight, Jonathan. It's, um, it's a fraction of the people we could get in. It's a fraction of those who are there week after week. But I know that every single person in this room tonight would like to say through you, to you, and to your father, the biggest and warmest thank you for what you've done and your kind words for Steve Ball. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Hayward. Four hundred and eighty six appearances, one hundred and ninety four goals. Let's have a look at John Richards. Shaw now with this free kick for Wolves. Time ticking away from them towards half time. Goalkeeper's come and lost it. And that is number nine, John Richards. It's a level score. You broke uh, two records, uh, got 195 goals, which knocked back John, Rec uh, John Richards' record. Yeah, I remember that one. I was, uh, that was against Derby. Uh, it was a bit of a fluke goal. It was uh, a missing shot, but it went to the back, and it was, it was the end of the Wolves fans as well. It will always rank as one of the best investments Wolverhampton Wanderers ever made. I'm delighted that he's here tonight. We're all delighted that he's back as a part of the club. Would you welcome? Mr. John Richards.
I think I'm a little grey now, Bob, as well, aren't I? Not quite as grey as you. I didn't notice. <laughs> it's, um, I was about to say, it doesn't seem long since we stood on this platform together when it was John's testimony, and then, as he said, when you look at your hair then and now and mine, it is a while ago, isn't it? Yeah, well, actually, those goals were um, 26 years ago, 1970, 71 Ooh. season. Long time. Yes. Tell me about this guy standing on your left. Um, well, I don't think uh, I can say much that uh, you know, people have already said about him. When you look at the, uh, from a goal scoring point of view, um, I did hold the, the goal scoring record. And I think at that time, um, it was difficult to imagine that it would be broken for two reasons. One, you wouldn't get a, a player stopping for, with, with a club for virtually the whole of his career. And even in my day, that was getting rarer and rarer. And secondly, um, to get a, a goal scorer or, or a player to score uh, an average of 20 goals a season for a minimum of 10 seasons, takes some doing. But, but Stevie's absolutely murdered that. I think he scored uh, about 30 goals a season, which is a, an amazing number. And uh, a lot of, lot of them goals which you know, other people wouldn't score. Some fabulous goals. For 64,000, it's not been a bad buy, has he? Well, I don't know. How much does it work out per goal? <laughs> it's not a, not a great deal, is it, when you consider nearly 300 goals for 64,000 pounds. Um, it's been an amazing bargain, and it's been a massive asset to Wolves, and uh, I think probably as much as anything, uh, which I know the, the, the fans appreciate, is Steve's loyalty to Wolves. I don't think... <laughs> As John said, 20 odd years ago, he was doing that job. You could get no finer accolade of what Steve has done than from John Richards. John, thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Enjoy the night. Steve got his 200th goal for Wolves against Leicester City the 18th of August. 1992, it was 3-0. We will have a look at some moments from that game. We'll hear what Steve had to say about it. We'll hear what Graham Turner, who was the manager, had to say. And then something Steve hasn't yet seen. A little um, appreciation on the end of it. Here we go. We had a bit of a tussle again, me and the man Steve Walsh. Uh, uh, I went down the left side and the keeper dived at my feet and just went on his body with a left foot shot and that was it, the wall's end again. Anthony Thompson may look for Steve Ball down the centre. All flicked off the head of Walsh into the path of Ball. And that's it, the double century for this prolific marksman. I've taken an outside record and stuff like that. I used to drop the score goals. Didn't look the easiest of chances. Oh, it wasn't the easiest chance. It's, uh, flicked over the top. So Steve Walsh flicked it on. He hit me in the mouth, actually. I jumped in the air, he did it on the mouth. He come down. I just did the first time in front of the keeper. Lucky goal. Two games and two goals, not a bad start, is it? Not a bad start, it's one of the, one of the best starts I've had yet, and it's a, one of the best starts the club's had. In fact, that's 200 and the club record for Wolves for him now. Yeah, that's, that's a brilliant record in a short space of time. We hope he's another 200 in it. Final word, this, this, this Steve Bull business, because, I mean, he's been a pretty fierce competitor, Steve and you've had a few tassels over the years. Yeah, he's, he's OK, he's Bull, he's, you know, I've obviously, uh, I've kicked you a lot, Steve, haven't I? But, uh, you know, you've kicked me back, so uh, we've, we've took it, it uh, we've got it, took it on the chin and got on with the game, and uh, he's proved to be uh, a big uh, a big hit at Wolves, and uh, he, he's going to go down in, in the record books, obviously. He's, he's, a, he's a legend over there, so uh, uh, I wish him all the best in his uh, testimony year, and uh, I'm sure that uh, if we play again, it, it, uh, he'll be kicking me and I'll be kicking him, but... Uh, that's all we do, we fight for, for our teams and, uh, and it'll always be the same. Well, to be fair, we should uh, say many congratulations to Steve Walsh on last night and tell you that he recorded that interview specially for us on the eve of the Coca-Cola Cup final replay because he was running out of time. So, big thank you to Steve Walsh for that. So, um, See, what's that, 10 years you've been kicking lumps out of each other, isn't it? It's about 10 years, yeah. Uh, a lot of people say... Is it, is it still as much fun? 
It is, yeah. It's, he, he, he's, he's the same as me. He, he wants to win all the time. He wants, you know, you get out there and just, just want to win. And if anything stands in his way, he's gonna, he's gonna move it out the way. And I'm the same. And when we clash, it's one of those things. I get the impression, though, that he's getting a bit easy to wind up, isn't he? Well, it's, it's so easy. A lot of people say he was the hardest defender I've played against. And a lot of people say Steve Walsh, well, he's, he's the idiot of them all. He's, you can wind him up so easy and just touch him and he'll, he'll flip and he'll kick me and he's off. But uh, <laughs> that's the way you have to wind these defenders up. So really, there was no, no better place and no better opportunity for you to have got your 200th goal, was there? I don't know at all now. I've, I've got no, no disrespect for Steve Walsh because I respect him as a player the way he is. But uh, against Leicester as well, the 200 goals in front of the South Bank, it was uh, brilliant. Steve, thanks very much, and I say again our thanks to Steve Walsh for that uh, little contribution. <laughs> let, us, um, let us consider then that having Steve at Wolves gave the popular spread of the unofficial magazine, the fanzine, the perfect title. What else could they have called it but a load of bull, and that is exactly what they call it. We would like now to Welcome on stage uh, two people, and they're going to bring another guest on in a moment. First of all, Charles Ross, who is the editor of A Load of Ball, and Jenny Wilkes from Radio WM, and she's a big Wolves fan, as you know. Come and join us, please, Charles and Jenny. <laughs> Charles, you could not have called the magazine anything but A Load of Ball, could you? Couldn't really know, and it's been a load of Steve for the last 10 years, and I think we owe this bloke a debt of gratitude which we as fans can never repay but one thing's for sure we'll certainly never forget it I think the loyalty factor which John Richards was just talking about really is the thing here's a bloke who must have had any number of offers to leave Wolves has always said no refused to be bought by Graham Taylor when he was at Villa refused to be sold by the same manager when he was at Wolves and he <laughs> and Steve has given up the best years of his playing career to try and get Wolverhampton Wanderers out of this godforsaken hellhole of a division. And he's still there now. And he must have got personal ambitions. More international caps who had played for a top club, I'm sure, and the London press would have picked him. Honours, championship medals. Instead, he stayed with us and he sacrificed his career on the altar of getting Wolverhampton Wanderers back where they belong. Steve Ball has put the heart and soul back into Wolves. Charles, um, one of the delights of the fanzine is that they're somewhat irreverent and, and they will have a go at anybody. I mean, you surely have never had a go at Steve, have you? Could do, could you know? I think as uh, another famous Wolves manager in the audience tonight said, have a go at Steve Bull and you'll be found swinging from the nearest Wolverhampton lamppost. <laughs> and uh, in the one of the most famous Wolves quotes, and, and rightly so. He's an icon and he deserves every single thing he gets in his testimonial year. I don't think we will ever see a player like him again. And although. I know for 12, 13 years now, I haven't seen Wolves play in the top flight. Personally, I just count myself privileged to have stood and watched this bloke play out his career for Wolves. Well, Ross, thank you. We've waited a long time to, uh, and this is not a sexist comment, to have a pretty lady on the stage, Jenny. Nice to see you here. A lady who's always to be seen around Wolverhampton Wanderers on match days. And um, let me guess, you're a fan, aren't you? Just a bit, yes. I remember seeing John Richards, actually. I remember those early goals. It was taking me back in time, just a touch. Listen, I want to say... You must have been very, very small then, and very young. Oh, oh yeah, very, very little. Yeah. Say your bit. <laughs> uh, I want to say a word or two for the fans, as the president of Wolverhampton Wanderers Supporters Club. I want to say, Steve, that... We think you are probably just as big a fan of Wolverhampton Wanderers as we are. That's what makes you so special to us, the fact that you're a fan as well. And I think we love you as much as you love Wolverhampton Wanderers. And we just want to say a really big thank you to you for sticking around and sticking with us, because we know you could have disappeared, but for still being here with us and staying the course. Very big thank you from all of the fans. Jenny, I think, 
a lot of people here and a lot of people who couldn't get in here tonight because we could have filled this place three times over, believe you me, uh, would probably lay claim to the title Steve Ball's biggest fan. You may be able to help me out here. That's right. We've been running a competition in conjunction with the Sports Argus on Radio WM to find Steve Ball's biggest fan. We were absolutely inundated with entries. Um, we, we whittled it down. And um, along with Phil Smith from the Post and Mail, we got, to, we got the dog called Steve Bull, who wears the, uh, <laughs> wears the shirt. We got the man with Steve Bull tattooed on his back. But our number one Steve Bull fan, the one that... I dread to think. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Andy, who said that about you? They're a cruel lot, aren't they? They've paid to come in, you know. Sorry, Jenny. <laughs> this chap was nominated by his kids. He was nominated by a woman who now he claims he doesn't know. And he sent us in a folder absolutely jam-packed full of pictures of his house. He had a room built specially on the house that he had before with the, all of the Wolves memorabilia on the walls and the bully bar. Now he's got a, a room in his current house full of Wolves memorabilia. He was telling me that he's got a bit of a, a psychic intuition and when they were playing Barnsley away the other day, two minutes into the game, he was doing something completely different, had a bit of a doo 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 doo, bully scored sort of feeling. And he was right. Who is this gentleman? This gentleman is Robert McNally. And he's here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Robert, come and join us. I don't mind. Not there. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me, have you been this close to Steve before? I have, yeah, <laughs> a few occasions. So, so <laughs> leave Tomo out of this, come on, we'll be in trouble. Tell me, what is so special about Steve Ball? Hmm. Everything he's done for the club since he's came here, I've idolised him, and I suppose many others have, and now they have. Yep, he's just done so much for the club, yeah. Congratulations, Steve. You deserve this night tonight. You've given us 10 good years of football, and I wish for another 10 good years. Robert Merali, thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Central defenders see him when he nutmegs them and elbows them to the ground. Goalkeepers see him when they pick the ball out the net. You see him on a Saturday, we see him on the television. But away from Wolverhampton Wanderers, Steve Ball does an awful lot of things. I'm not, this is not a hero bit. This is something that I'm sure you probably already know have seen in the papers. He gives up an awful lot of his spare time to helping a lot of people who are a lot worse off than he or you or I or any of us are. He likes to uh, particularly go into hospitals and if you've seen the kids' faces when he walks in, well, you, ha you maybe haven't, so let's have a look at them, shall we? <laughs> Ticklish. Hey. His mum's gone red. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve has done his bit, as I say, going around the hospital. Can I have it? Can I have it? You'll see the odd wolf's favour floating gone, around here and there. It's gone. But, uh, well, These are not things that have been set up and staged. You can still keep running, that's why For cameras. He should be around. Steve normally goes and does this when no one's around but the parents yeah. of the sick children hey, and the You're children right? themselves. Yeah, you all right? Going quiet, aren't they? <laughs> Going quiet. This one looks uh, a bit poorly there, is it? Yeah, she's had a We've got a couple of people who want to just come on and tell you a little bit more about that side of Steve. One's a family friend. Glyn Wetton and the other, well, you might just recognise him. I don't think he's changed. He played a record 609 times in old gold, Derek Parkin. Tell you what, he's like Johnny doesn't look any different, does he? Heavens above. Derek, let me ask you. No grey hair. Oh, John, that was a dig at you, not me, wasn't it, for sure. 
Derek, just tell us a little bit about uh, this man, the, the, the other side of Steve Ball that maybe everybody doesn't know. Well, I, I know Steve through, through Glyn, really, and he does a, an awful lot of uh, work for Glyn, a lot of charity work, uh, goes to hospitals. Um, I mean, the guy is just phenomenal, really. Uh, he's a credit to Wolverhampton Wonders. Well, Glenn. <laughs> just coming a little closer so we can get you to the microphone. Uh, you are um, described as a family friend, which will do for us tonight. Just tell us a bit about uh, Steve and, and the, the things he gets up to. Well, Bob, this is where his night goes wrong, really. This is where he's going to be very embarrassed because he hates people knowing what he really does do. And if anybody wants any money for raising for anything, all he says is no problem. And uh, he's just phenomenal. And he comes down to some disabled units, uh, people who've never had a job before, and he makes their life important. He's, nothing's too much trouble for him. And well, before they ca he came, they were nothing. Today, they're important because they can get Steve Bull's autograph. Tell me. I was actually in the hospital with Steve when we did that filming, so I've seen the reaction he gets. You see it a lot more. Oh, yeah. When it was his birthday two weeks ago, I took one of the lads over, and Steve made him king at his house. And we, he had a big slice of his piece of cake, of his birthday cake, and he kept saying to Steve, bigger, bigger, bigger. And he, he got the piece of cake down, and he went into Steve's trophy room, pictures with his England caps, the lot. And that lad now is king of Colesley. Steve, are you embarrassed by all this? I always get embarrassed things like that because everybody out there should do things like that as well. It's nothing off my back and it shouldn't be off anybody else's back. So, but I do get embarrassed. Just a final word, uh, Derek, to you. Uh, 609 appearances. Is, is that ever going to be beaten? I think Steve will he'll beat it if he keeps clear of injuries. I hope he does. I hope he does. I say it wouldn't be a bad choice to break it, would he? Oh, I couldn't wish for anybody else to break it. As gentlemen, our thanks to Glyn Witten and to Derek Parkin. Well, as I said, we've got a couple of people who are uh, very close to Steve within Wolverhampton Wanderers, and they can tell us a little bit about uh, what he does and the value that he brings to the club and to the town. The club's commercial manager, Gary Lever, is here, and also a lady forever to be seen around the club. Many people best remember her as the most famous lady ever to play cricket for England with Gary Lever. Would you welcome, please, Rachel Hayhoe Flint. Well, Gary, um, you see the fans coming into the shops and buying their bits and pieces, and I know because I've been there, it's, it's not unusual to see Steve popping across the car park and into the shop. What's, what's it like for you and the fans when he does that? Well, I think, um, first of all, Steve's a, a real Wolf supporter's dream. Uh, he's had a number of opportunities to go to the, into the Premiership, which he's, he's never, ever wanted to do. Uh, and the reason he's not wanted to do that is because of his genuine love for Wolves Football Club and his genuine love for the Wolves supporters. And that is very, very genuine. And when he's around the shop and, and fans catch a glimpse of him, the tills must be ringing, mustn't they? Well, they are, yes. And, um, of course, Steve's always ready, willing and able, so to speak, to go out there and speak to them. Uh, sign autographs because he, he wants to be with them because he's part of, the, of, the, of those supporters. And I think it's fair to say, Rachel, isn't it? It's, the, it's that fact that Steve is and always has been a part of the community which must make it very easy for you. We've heard about him doing good work with charity, but I know there's a, a huge amount of requests come your way for uh, things to happen in and around the club. Yes, it always amazes me, though, that no footballers keep diaries. And uh, Steve is a man of many words, and you sort of say, could you do that? Would you? <laughs> you know, he always speaks very long sentences. <laughs> and, um, you know, I say, well, could you possibly go to this school and present some prizes? Why me? <laughs> you, know, 
and I say, well, you're so lovely and beautiful, you know, that's why they all want you, see. But um, the other factor is that, uh, unfortunately, Sir Jack Haywood can't be here tonight, but I spoke to him this afternoon, and he very much regrets, Steve, that he can't be here. But um, Jack is the sort of person who loves anything that is great, that is loyal, T typically British, which is what Steve is, um, in Who's Who, which is the book that talks about posh people and says what they are, it says that Sir Jack Haywood likes things that are all things bright, beautiful, and British. Well, I know Steve is British. I don't know about... Bright, yes. <laughs> I don't know about the beautiful, but he really is phenomenal with terminally ill people. Um, a woman wrote to me two years ago. She got a week to live. Her dying wish was please... Could she meet Steve Ball? And without hesitation, Steve was there to meet this lady. And I just wish that the whole world could know about the generosity of spirit of this lad. His golf's bloody awful, but otherwise, he's a wonderful <laughs> chap. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Lever and Rachel Hayhoe Flint. Thank you very much indeed. August the 17th, 1996, against Grimsby Town, Steve Ball scored a hat-trick, the 17th of his career at Wolves, breaking Billy Hartill's club record. We're going to see those goals in a moment. We're also going to see a guy who, from time to time, he seems to pull some very odd faces. <laughs> You might just have guessed that our next guest on Steve's This Is Your Life is Don Goodman. Good. <laughs> The first thing I need to do, uh, I know this is Steve's big night, but uh, I have to make a uh, public, public apology to all you uh, lip readers out there. I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> that apart, that's my first question gone. Um, what about these, these um, little um, faces that you pull? Well... <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Well, you've got to be good at something, haven't you, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, where do they, do you, I mean, when you look at the celebrations these days, I mean, do you, do you practice, spend time in training, rehearsing them? I don't score enough goals in training to rehearse them. <laughs> Freedom the lines, in they go. <laughs> Lamb to the slaughter. 
Um, now, what about Steve and his hat tricks? I mean, have you ever been a part of, of that sort of thing? Well, um, I got the itinerary uh, only yesterday, I think it was, to say that I was number 18 on the list, and uh, I was happy to be number 18. And uh, then the subject was next to it, and it said uh, hat tricks. <laughs> Oops. Not unusual, you might think, a fellow striker. Uh, being asked to talk about hat-tricks of his uh, pal and uh, fellow striker. Uh, very unusual when I don't think he's ever scored a hat-trick when I've been in the team. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> Is that you've right? Been, you've been playing so to say, to say I was worried was uh, an understatement, and uh, I now suppose that uh, you and Roberts will be wearing the number 10 shirt on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Um, being half serious for a moment, and I know we can't be more than half serious, he's, um, he's not bad, is he? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's possibly the biggest understatement of the evening, you know. I think, uh, as a striker, you appreciate just how difficult it is to, to stick the ball in the net on that regular basis. And uh, I understand Steve's got the, a record number of hat-tricks. Um, I think I've got four. And I think Steve's probably got six or seven times more than that, you know, which is a great testament to him. Um, there's nobody in the business better at doing what he does, and um, he deserves absolutely everything he gets. The accolades from you lot, and uh, all the awards that hopefully he's still got to get. And gentlemen, Don Goodman, thank you very much. Well, any manager will tell you that the thing he likes to do when he's picking his team is right in the three key positions. They used to be called centre forward, centre half and goalkeeper. There's no point in having a guy like Steve scoring you hundreds of goals if they're going in at the other end. One man's had a very, very good season for Wolves. Let's have a look at just a few of the best of his moments. Leach. Scott Leach hitting one! Stahl didn't look particularly comfortable with it. You might just have guessed that our next guest is Mike Stahl. Well, it's nice of you to bring a few of your fans in with you tonight, Mike. Um, question one. What's he like as a captain? Well, to be fair, he's probably the least vocal of a captain I've ever played with. You know, which is a good job after, like, you know, what Tom Hall says, because we can't understand the bloody word he's saying anyway, you know? <laughs> I mean, it well, you know. So, uh, the only sight you virtually see a bully as a captain is, the worst sight, really, is, is when we've conceded, and he's like, on the halfway line, you know, he's putting on large chin up. And that's, you know, and that has to be signal, because we don't really know what he's saying anyway. There's a, there's a little book I know floating around, which is, is headed Discipline and Fines, which I think Steve was instrumental in bringing in. Is this right? Oh, he's such a nitpicker. Him and Tom O, like, uh, and Don. Don's the other one who's in charge of the book. And every morning they sit there, and if you come in and, you know, you're a second late, or you've left the soap in the bath, or you've left the plug in the bath, they're chasing you around. Come on here, two pounds, two pounds. And Tom O's a little giggler, isn't he? Like the man on his shoulder, you know. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you know, that horrible little devil that's on your shoulder. Steve, 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 he's late. Steve. <laughs> and he, he, he didn't tell you himself because you just say, shut off, Tomo, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then Bullet says, and growls at you and gets you in his, his famous Vulcan grip and then that's it, you know, you just pay up. <laughs> yes, and have your money, you know? Are you, are you trying to ask me to ask these people to have a whip round to pay your fines? I've got a few fines after QPR anyway. Uh, <laughs> I could do with a payment. Actually, I, you know, I got a little bit worried tonight because I just walked in and I saw uh, uh, the chairman sat there and, and, you know, Peter Shilton sat next to him. I'm thinking. 
<laughs> Actually, I feel a bit rotten now because I interviewed the manager this afternoon and I thought he told you. Oh, well. <laughs> Here. You know, he dare face me, but uh, you know, it's a measure of the man to have the two best English goalkeepers in the same room with a minute, you know? <laughs> the, um, I mean, Peter, I mean, you, you face Bully once and he scored past you, you know, think of me, I face him every bloody day. <laughs> Shoots at me all day. I'm knackered. If, if you did have to face him on a regular basis, would you um, think of giving up goalkeeping? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I don't know whether I'm the luckiest keeper or the unluckiest keeper, you know. I don't have to face him on a Saturday in the comp you know, competitions, which is great. But like I say, every day, Monday to Friday, you know, he just loves shooting. You know, and he just keeps kicking the ball at me. So, well, I wish it was at me. I might save a few, but, you know, it's all in the corners, you know. So, uh, it's been a privilege to work with him, you know. And uh, he's a super chap, super bloke, and, and it says it all. I mean, everyone's come out here, marvellous. Mike Stowell. Well, there's been so much happened in Steve's career that you worry that you might not include it all, but a little early this year, Steve broke a record. It was held in the West Midlands by a man from you know where. This is how he did it. Yes. And Simons has let it go. Ball could be through here and is. Disaster for Manchester City. Kit Simons let ball go. Full dividends for Steve Ball as he rattles up his ninth goal of the season. When it was messy play, Dennis Pierce has got the ball up, he launches the ball forward. Kit Simons has misjudges it completely. From set, his other defenders nowhere to be seen. That's horrendous defending by Manchester City. And uh, for an international of Simons, he'd be very, very disappointed. Ball gets him on the blind side, and once he sets off, he crashes that ball in. Steve Ball marks his 400th league appearance for Wolves in the manner in which you'd expect, with a goal. As I said, the records keep a tumbling, and last night in Birmingham at the Sports Argus Centenary Awards, Steve got a very special presentation in recognition of his goal-scoring exploits. That event was, I say, the Sports Argus, and tonight we're delighted to say that the Birmingham Post and Mail have uh, sponsored this event. Would you welcome, please, their promotions manager, Phil Smith. I notice, Phil, that you are clutching what one might best describe as um, a large black box. Tell us what's in it. That's right. It's uh, an award that uh, we were pleased to give to Steve last night at the Sports Argus uh, dinner. Uh, and it commends 300 goals. Uh, the man from the black country that we think will never be beaten. And we'd like to produce to him the Mizuno Golden Boot Award. And that presentation will now be made. I can tell you it's very heavy. Bill Smith and the Golden Boots for the 300 goal man, Steve Ball. It's the uh, 34th minute last season when the first goal was struck by Steve Ball. Might uh, repeat it here. Oh, yes, how about that? He's just two minutes off schedule. 1-0 to Wolverhampton Wanderers. And Steve Bull celebrates his 300th senior goal. Goodman out uh, jumping for him there, and a chance here, but Bull 2-0. Goodman it was who unsettled him. Again, full second of the afternoon, his 301st goal.
Well, I know that um, I say you've sponsored this evening, and, and as a Wolves fan, you must have uh, one or two memories of uh, Steve. Certainly have. I um, work in Birmingham, but was born with a, a mile of the football ground, so Wolverhampton through and through. Um, we're very pleased that Steve has joined our team and writes for the Argus every night. Uh, I come over and see the team whenever we ever possibly can. And uh, we're just pleased to have somebody that's going to stay with us and write with us, we hope, you know, for as long as you play with Wolves. So thanks very much, Steve, and look forward to many more goals and many more memories. Thanks. And our thanks to Phil Smith from the Birmingham Post and Mail, tonight's sponsors. When you're uh, putting together occasions and nights like this, it's always nice to have one or two um, special things just to show that Steve is not only appreciated by the Wolves fans and the public around these parts, but uh, all over the place. Every team in the Premiership sent either a signed shirt or signed football to be used at Steve's testimonial auction. And just to show you that <clears throat> and just, we have the, the living proof, as they say. Here are our members of the Briley Hill and Dudley Schools FA Under-15s modelling those shirts. The first one, I might tell you, to send a shirt to Steve was Steve Walsh of Leicester City, signed by the rest of the team. Here he comes now. We'll call them on. In a group, we have Leicester City. Where, oh, here they come, they're coming down behind us, they caught us all. Here we are, a shirt from Leicester City, signed by Steve Walsh and the squad, followed by an Aston Villa shirt, signed and presented by Dwight York, and signed by the rest of the Aston Villa first team squad. From Highbury, we have a football signed by the Arsenal team. From Leeds United, we have a shirt signed by Ian Rush, who I know was Steve's hero, goal scorer. The rest of the Leeds team have signed it. And here comes the Leeds shirt, followed by a football signed and donated by Tottenham Hotspur. <laughs> Behind him, we have a shirt signed and sent to us by John Solarco and the Coventry City team. And close behind him, we have a shirt from Blackburn Rovers. From Rude Hullet at Stamford Bridge, we have a football signed by Chelsea. And from Anfield, a shirt signed by the entire Liverpool squad. And behind that, Manchester United, the shirt from David Beckham. And lastly, from Newcastle United, it's the actual shirt that was worn by Peter Beardsley in the 1996 Charity Shield against Manchester United. There is one more shirt which has been sent for auction. It's an England shirt signed and donated by the England captain and the PFA Player of the Year, Alan Shearer. Tonight, Steve. That shirt comes on stage modeled by what we hope might one day be another center forward at Wolves. It's young Jack, he's five years old. Here he comes. All right. Come on, Jack. Hello. And Steve's wife, Julie, Hello. is also Hello. here to join us on stage. Well, I suppose the hardest part is telling you all that we're finished. <laughs> it is sad, isn't it? Quite right, young man. Quite right. Steve, we, in the time-honoured tradition, we'll have a red book that will be filled with mementos of this evening. 
It's very difficult, as I say, to know. I do hope that we haven't missed anything out along the way, and I do hope that you've enjoyed being up here and seeing all these people talking about you and the part you've played in Wolverhampton Wanderers. It is an inestimable one, a one that all the people in this room and the many who couldn't be here and the many who'll be there on Saturday and those who'll be there next season in the Premiership will one day turn around and say, without Steve Bull, it'd have been a hell of a lot harder. Having done a few things around Wolves over the years, I can tell you that there's nowhere else you go within a very long way of here to get the reaction, the support, the passion that is football that you get from Wolverhampton Wanderers. And that, of course, is from all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been my privilege to be your host tonight. I do hope you've enjoyed it. We'll have a little music and a few pictures. And Steve and Julie and Jack will come to the centre of the stage and take the applause that is rightly theirs. As we say, Steve Bull, tonight, this is your life.